Welcome to the Sandersonian Institute of Cosmere Studies, where there's always another secret. Welcome back, everybody. We missed you. Did you miss us? Hopefully you did, because it's just great to be wanted. Anyway, welcome back to the Sandersonian Institute of Cosmere Studies, Episode 10. Today is July 23rd, 2018, and in this episode, we are going to continue our exploration of Nalthus, Warbreaker, and their place in the greater Cosmere. For our audience members who are listening to the podcast or watching the videos on YouTube, don't forget that we record each episode live at www.twitch.tv slash innkeepers table where we've got a live chat running. If you want to take an active part in the discussion, be sure to join us every other Monday night starting at 7.30 p.m. Pacific time, 10.30 p.m. Eastern time. We would love to have you here. As always, I am Bill and I am joined by my heterochromatic hosts, Jordan and Amy. Welcome. Hello. I keep thinking you're going to run out of adjectives, <laughs> and I then forget what your degree's in, so... I'm an English it's... major. I don't run out of adjectives. <laughs> the sources are your friend. Uh, but it's great to be back. How have y'all been? What have you been up to? Anything exciting? Um, I'm working on Lady Tremaine, which is my crazy costume. I made a ring. That's terrifying. And some, and some earrings, and I have a wig. And I bought For those who aren't necessarily <laughs> Disney-savvy... Remind people who Lady Tremaine is. She is the, I can't remember if it's wicked or evil stepmother. Evil, in evil stepmother. Wicked Witch of the West. The one who has Anastasia and Drizella as her daughters, and she keeps putting the poor Cinderella down. Yep. So. She's the uh, bad example for, for stepmothers everywhere. Yep. I know some great stepmothers, so. Uh, how about you, Jordan? What are you up to? Uh, well, I don't know any great stepmothers. That's not uh, a field that I'm just well-versed in. But i uh, been doing a lot of uh, amiibo combat and working on secret things for my stream with one bill, doing magic with uh, some audio stuff that I'm looking forward to. Yeah, it's I, I'm a wizard. It's kind of fun. Actually, it's not anything super exciting if you're an actual audio person but to anybody who's not it's like the blackest witchcraft there is actually you know what there's like no overlap between people who like my amiibo stuff and people who pay attention to this podcast so <laughs> the i find this interesting where my name is splice and so i'm running with the gag of the splice climbers instead of the ice climbers and Bill has cobbled together sounds from the announcer in Smash Brothers so that he says splice climbers instead of ice climbers. And it's it's, it's magical. That is fun. It's fun. It, it, it's one of those things that you do it and then you just grin way more than you realize it's worth. But it's just fun. So, so if you'd like to just cross over and decide to be in that, that little Venn diagram of people who listen to the podcast and watch my actual stream, you know, you can enjoy that magic. We've got, we've got a few of those, I think. Just a couple, but not, but there's a, a few. And if you like cosplay, you can look at my stuff, too, and have another Venn diagram. It'll be great. Hey, <laughs> and board games, you can look at my stuff, and then we'll have a really big Venn diagram. It'll be crazy. So, anyway, so anyway. Are, we doing, are we doing the giveaway now? Yes, so we have some exciting news. So, Amy, why don't you tell us what's going on? So, for those visually impaired people who are just listening to us, I'm showing a lovely patch with an iron-on thing that I will attach if that is what the winner wants to do instead of sewing it on. So he can have either option. But we're going to have Jordan do a random number generator, and I'm going to look at my list of lovely people who liked the post with my awkward video. Remind them why we're, we're having a giveaway. Because we have a hundred, and actually it's more than that now, followers on Instagram. Yay! Woo! I'm doing jazz hands. I don't know hey, why. I do jazz hands. They don't even show up at the YouTube video. The circle's oh, too small. It's too small. Uh, oh, well. I was doing jazz hands, in case you are wondering. So. 
This is amazing for the audio only listeners. All right, so RNG, here we go. Random number generator turns the number eight. eight. Random soul shine. You are our winner. So I'm Congratulations. Gonna to, yeah, I'm going to figure out how to message you, and then we will make that happen. So, yeah. Awesome. Unless you message me first, and that's fine. And just as a reminder, thank you to all of our Instagram followers. Mm -hmm. And as a reminder to those who aren't, you can find us on Instagram at instagram.com slash Cosmere Studies. We would love to have you there. We try and post, you know, any exciting news that we have. We post about episodes as we're getting started and just fun stuff about the Cosmere as we see it. So, yeah, it's me doing photography things and random pictures of Cosmere puppies sometimes, too, as well. Yeah, Amy has fun with it, and we yeah, really making, appreciate the work she puts into Alamancer, it. Making so. Alamancer, you know, vials <laughs> different, using charcoal from us barbecuing and other things like that. That's what that was. It was charcoal from the grill. And <laughs> I saw your little, uh, your little awakened straw. I know. I, those are really hard to make. I'm <laughs> bad with, like, straw people or in, like, grass. And it, I, yeah, I'm not meant for that job. Basher's got a huge leg up on me on that. So. Well, I mean, he's been practicing a little longer than you. Yeah, so. just just a little bit, and it's more important to him. So. Mm -hmm. Oh, hundreds of years of living. Yeah. Get mad skills. Yep. Yep. Yeah. All right. And everyone from Groundhog Day. <laughs> <laughs> so should we uh, dive in? Yes. All right. Now, just before we go in, uh, before we start talking about what's going on, um, we want to give a reminder to those of you who may just be tuning in. For the first several episodes, we are taking a broad look at each book, just sort of doing an overview, uh, taking a couple episodes to just talk about basic general points in the book. Then later on, we're going to dive into some of the concepts that span across different series, discuss what we're calling aluminum foil hat theories. Um, and of course, we would love to hear what theories you have. So feel free to um, submit any of those to us on our social media accounts or on our YouTube comment section, or probably the best way, send us an email at Cosmere studies at gmail.com. Um, so let's go ahead and just jump on in. Uh, last week we talked a lot about um, the dichotomy with Siri and Vivina. Mm -hmm. We talked about the magic system itself. Um, but I think we might want to just start diving in on some of the other characters as well, and some of the individual characters. Because we looked at Siri versus Vivina. We didn't really look at Siri or Vivina. And then there was also, one thing um, at Susebrin, Parlin. And Blush Weaver. Yeah, there's, there's just a lot of people. So. And Light Song. So, Jordan, where, uh, where would you like to start? I'd like to start with the utterly adorable relationship between Sasebrin and Siri. Oh. I I did not expect it to be good. I it's really so didn't. Cute. It's the kind of thing that could easily be ruined. Brandon did a really good job with it. Um, I'm still not entirely sure how old Sasebrin is supposed to be because it's like he's been re reigning for decades. Well, has he been reigning for decades? Is that a rumor that priests have spread or is he yeah you know, he's I, I, he's I, reigned for decades he's like that that's, that's pretty, true he's reigned since pretty, he was born that's yeah. true it's that's pretty well documented when he mm -hmm. took over but i don't know the the things i enjoyed about their relationship just because i'm mm -hmm. not normally into sort of the the relationship that's not why i tune into these books and don't right. examine my use of verb there but um the uh the thing that I liked about it was I loved how 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 just pure their their relationship was. It really is. Which which is impressive given that the relationship started with her stripping for him. Mm -hmm. And it's just it, typically relationships that start that way aren't as wholesome. Oh, yeah. But then yeah. you know, he talks again, we mentioned this last time, but when he talks to her about the first night, he was just like it was interesting. <laughs> he just sort of... I'll bet it was, Susie. I, I, he, he didn't know. Yeah. But just the fact that he has no idea. I just loved his comment. 
I think we're doing something wrong. There should have been a baby by <laughs> the now. The baby's not happening. What's going on? You're just like, well, no. We you're... spent the night in the room together. That's how you do it, right? right? That's that's what happens. So it's, it's good. It's like, well, you're not wrong. You're not wrong that something, you're doing something wrong. That's correct. Well, I just love how confused he is when she puts on her little performance for the sake of the priest. And he's just sort of, <laughs> I'm sure he's just, I could just imagine him sitting there with just a raised eyebrow of, are they doing like what i don't the I world don't makes no sense anymore it reminds me of when harry met sally i'll have what she's had <laughs> yeah <laughs> the the other uh. thing that, that that was and this is not the wholesome part it's just the part that i would totally i i understand siri is when they order a bunch of food in and mm. and you know they're trying all these things but my favorite part is she starts just staring at him with this mental image of trying to figure out, how does he eat? He has no tongue. <laughs> like, I just, that part of, like, morbid curiosity, I totally understand. And I'm with Siri yeah. there. I would totally have been rudely staring, trying to figure out how he swallows with no tongue. And frankly, I'm still kind of curious. There has to be some gravity involved, because otherwise I don't... Well, if only there was some... Say, uh... Cosmere space magic. Yeah. That's it. You guys keep talking about them. I'm going to figure out this. Uh... Oh, no, no, Jordan, Jordan, no. Yeah. <laughs> we have another friend but... who I'm sure could figure it out. Um, we have someone who does audiology and stuff like that, so he knows about tongues. That's true. Could always ask him. We could always get the beat of her. Yeah. Um, but now, just looking specifically at Siri, because we've looked at Siri versus Vivina, but we haven't looked at Siri herself. Mm -hmm. um, it's just an interesting situation she's been pushed to. She grew up as essentially the spare. You know, the there spare really, spare. yeah, there wasn't really any place for her, and then suddenly she's thrust into. Oh, by the way, everything relies on you. Mm -hmm. And she takes that responsibility seriously, but it freaks her out really mm -hmm. bad at first. And that's the thing that I love because the very first thing we see is she's known as sort of the irresponsible one, the the flighty one, the one who will push the rules and stuff like that. But as soon as she's put in a position where it's like, okay, we are giving you a lot of responsibility. She steps up. And I love that. Um, but she does really well considering she has like nothing really to work with. And no training. Mm -hmm. and, and not, I mean, not, not for a lack of them trying to train her. Yeah. Just, Fair she, enough. I think it's uh, funny. Like she's, she's helping Susan Brin learn stuff and she's like, oh, my tutors would just be rolling. <laughs> they would be loving yeah. to knowing that I'm trying to teach now, and I wasn't paying attention enough yeah. before. Oh, man. But yeah, she, she's just, she's a really interesting character because it's a play on the, the flighty, sort of thoughtless person, but again, she immediately steps up. It's not just a, you know, she grows over the course of, she just says, okay, I'm putting into this space, what do I do not to screw things up? <laughs> Yeah, and I mean, she she does look around for help, mm -hmm. which probably gets her, it does get into her trouble. But I mean, it's also hard to tell who to trust. Even I'm sure Vivenna would have had issues figuring mm -hmm. out who to trust too. Well, cause it's because both of them have the huge problem of they have massive biases that are mm -hmm. getting in their way, both from their end and the other end. Because all you have to do is see the how Trelides speaks to her and talks down to her and how blue fingers is always sort of rolling his eyes at her and then right. how she's sitting here worried about you know people stealing her soul and yeah. it's just, there's so many prejudices going all sorts of directions that for at least i'd say the first almost full third of the book everyone is mm -hmm. talking at one another yeah. So I think Siri drops a lot of her prejudices a lot faster than yeah. Vivenna does, especially mm -hmm. with the whole like I can't wear color. I'm not, you know, because she she didn't really like a lot of those rules anyway, and now she's all of a sudden thrust into you're wearing these really extravagant gowns, you're eating this extravagant food. She's like, I like the flavors. This is good. I like these dresses. They're really pretty. And she's even analyzing, going, Well, they're gonna burn the dress. I'm gonna save the really pretty ones for later. <laughs> well, so. and you've got to remember um, the scene where. Vivina shows up where where Ciri is presented to the, mm -hmm. the court of the gods, 
and Vivina sees Siri and she thinks, oh, she must be so terrified. She's, she's being forced to wear these these immodest gowns. And Siri's just looking around, huh, cool. You know? But she's like, I picked this dress. I like this yeah. dress. It's just you know, and, but but Vivina again with these prejudices that she's you know she just is thinking oh, they've tortured her and they're forcing her to wear this and she's chosen the one that she's wearing, mm-hmm. the, the the mullet skirt as I call it because it's short in the front and long in the back. So. <laughs> those are weird dresses. I don't have one of those and I'm okay yeah. with that. But and then also the first time where she chooses a two piece dress and then realizes it bears her midriff and she's just like oh oh dear. <laughs> Too late now. I already mm-hmm. picked it. <laughs> The the other thing that is sort of interesting, I think part of her, Siri not paying attention to her tutors is also part of why she does adjust a bit. Because mm-hmm. if there's one theme that runs through this book is the dangers of assuming what you know. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And because Siri knew she didn't pay attention, she's able to be very humble about what she doesn't know because... She knows that she earned her ignorance. Mm-hmm. What's the saying? I think it was uh, Mark Twain, but I, of course, a lot of things are misquoted for being him. Um, it's it's not what you don't know; it's what you know for certain that just isn't true. Yeah, something, some, like that. something like that. Like yeah. that that that's what's the most dangerous. Yeah, because so. it's it's making those jumps and assumptions and going, mm-hmm. oh well, I don't have to analyze this and you miss details because you're exactly blindsided by your prejudice. But yeah, um, it's just, it's really interesting seeing, she, she's a really useful character, but both of them are used very well as a, a reader surrogate, mm-hmm. where they're outsiders in a place that they don't understand. She's in the Court of the Gods, and or Ciri's in the Court of the Gods, and Vivian is in the... Uh, the slums in the streets and whatever The else. slums in the streets, and, and mingling with the, uh, oh, I can't remember what they're called, the... Hollander? No, the other the where is she from? What's it called? Idris. The, I, Idris. Yeah. The, the Idrians. The other Idrians. Idrians. Yeah. Sorry. And it takes her a while to realize they're Idrians too, because she's kind of shocked when she finds out that oh, a bunch of these people who are here are my people, and I didn't even well, because that. yeah, and that's the thing is they've been living in this completely different world, and so mm-hmm. because the economy can't support them up in the mountains, and so mm-hmm. they're down here yeah. instead. Well, and the other thing that I find very interesting about their two different worlds that they're living and exploring is they they make them understand completely different parts of the society because mm-hmm. there's no reason for Siri to learn about awakening in mm-hmm. in her part right. of the world. She has to learn all the politics and that sort of gaming. Whereas Vivina learns all about awakening and heightenings because she gets a lot of breath shoved into her very early, and yeah. that, uh, pardon the pun, colors her entire view. And it affects how people react to her, too, because she can get into things because she has so many breaths. Yeah. I just love that. You just show up, and it's like, I'm an important person. You can tell because I glow. And well, I they think do, they do still get like a limited number of tickets or whatever that they can get into events, I think, mm-hmm. too. So they don't get to walk into every meeting, but they get to go into some like they get. But like meeting. for that one, she didn't even need a ticket. She just walked up and they said, oh, you're glowing. You can come in. Yeah. But I know like there were some that were more limited in what you could enter. Right. <clears throat> well, and then this is, you know, a public presentation of the new queen to the entire city. So, oh, yeah. Yeah. Right. Then Sisebron uh, was also interesting because he is—he's clearly the inverse of uh, of Vivina, in, in like because both are compl- like were groomed for their position, but mm-hmm. him being groomed made him very humble about his situation, and he took those lessons and was very non-judgmental about it. Uh, right. He 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 understood how how limited he was, mm-hmm. whereas Vivina viewed it as this is the gospel. And I found it very interesting that here he is being told he's a god, mm-hmm. yet he is 
and he is immensely humble about the fact that he's a god. Well, the thing that's interesting about him is, I mean, he's immensely powerful, like insanely powerful, to the point where he walks in the room and light explodes into rainbows, just because he's got that much power emanating from him. Mm -hmm. But he has no way to access it. Yep. And so he has just this enormous well of power but he can't get it's sort of uh tantalus yeah from greek mythology you know you have just ex exactly what you want but you cannot reach it you can't get it well so that's the other thing that's interesting because he actually could access the power uh because one of the things that the height means he's at is inaudible commands and one of the mm -hmm. things it, but he hasn't been trained in how to use it and the one thing they were going to train him in is how to pass the breath to right. the next person. It's the only thing they teach Yeah, and then him. he could go and live an ordinary life wherever, <laughs> or someone ordinary at least. Yeah, but because they never train him, he never... Well, no, he doesn't... He wouldn't go live an ordinary life somewhere because he's a, he's a return. So he has a week. Well, no, they said that he has enough breath because of him being the god king and the breath that he started with that he would have been able to be sustained on quite a bit still. Um, or that, it was all the breath that he was given at when he was he, the god but, king. But when he gives up his those extra breaths to the you next god king. No, there was some line about him being able to live on later. I don't remember that. But no, like I that, for this no, so because the, I remember distinctly. Okay. They did discuss it, but what they're talking about is he doesn't need to keep getting breaths because he has all those extra breaths. But if he gave up those extra breaths, he mm -hmm. would just be a normal return. There's nothing. Yeah, he, there's nothing yeah, actually the special about him. He's just. He's the only just thing a normal special return. about him is he was stillborn, and he was given a huge chunk from the previous God King. Yeah, right. But, but the thing is, once he passed on his wealth of breaths to the next God King, he's just got the one divine breath. He's a normal return. I could have sworn. I'm gonna keep looking because this is. I could. I know there was some line about yeah, that. Yeah, I remember thinking, okay, he'll they. The, the priests don't plan on him dying in a week. And mm. they would let him kind of live elsewhere or something. I'm, I must have missed that. No, but the... Uh, was, but yeah. I, it's, it's an interesting thing, because it's actually something that uh, Vivinum brings up about Vasher. About the fact that he's expensive to, to have around because he needs mm -hmm. one breath a week. And actually, if, could we talk about actually, Vasher? Yeah, because we we didn't really talk. We, it's it's immense. It's interesting that we didn't really talk about him that much last time. Even though he's your favorite <laughs> character in the entire Cosmere, second only to, or I guess he's your third, right? Uh, First is closer than his Nightblood. Yeah, then, then Nightblood, and then everyone else is you know sort of the different <laughs> things. Because Nightblood steals whatever scene Nightblood is in. Oh, <laughs> Nightblood! I totally. I saw uh, puppy of Doom. Yeah, I know, but. Vasher, uh, and I put this in the in the the show uh, overlay. I view him as sort of the opposite of Kelsier. Kelsier is glib and easy, get, gets along with people easily. Vasher is terse and doesn't get along with anyone very well. He is yeah. not it's, charismatic. It's he's not a people person. No, he's definitely not. <laughs> Kelsier has to devise this grand setup to become, you know, this this martyr figure, and it's a lie. Vasher actually was the big great king, the thing that saved them all. Well, first but the one, he's that also the them, one who destroyed the one it. That saved them all. <laughs> Kelsier does both in the same breath because he's Kelsier. To the point, to the point where historians were so confused by his actions that they said, "Oh, clearly these are two different people." They, and they gave the him multiple person. names. Yeah. Uh, and then the other thing that I found is just makes him very different from Kelsier. Kelsier didn't know the full game that was being played around him. Vasher is immensely aware of the full game, and that's the problem. Vasher has world hopped, and that's what led to the creation of of Nightblood and things like that. And so it's interesting how Kelsier has much less information, but is able, because of his force of charisma, is able to do a lot with it. Whereas Vasher has a ton, but he's sort of the one burdened with glorious purpose. Uh, nicely spoken. Thank you. 
I was proud of that, shoving that one in. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, that, like, and again, that's why it's interesting. Spoiler warning. Spoiler warning. Yeah. Okay. Spoiler warning moving forward. There are going to be spoilers for other books in the Cosmere that aren't Warbreaker. Five, four, three, two, one. You've been warned. And that's why, you know, Vasher showing up on Roshar is just, it's just an interesting concept because, you know, he's sick. One, he doesn't want to have to take breaths from other people. And two, it's a lot cheaper for him to survive on Roshar. And so it's just, it's really interesting seeing him as, like, because he's the first character, I think, that we've seen that deeply on multiple worlds. Yeah. Other than Hoyt. But Hoyt is... I, I would argue we Hoyt. haven't seen Hoyt d- deeply until That's Roshar. True. Yeah. Because we see him mostly in... Uh, yeah, in Wit. We, we see a lot of him, but... but yeah, no, so it's just... It... Uh, he's just so fascinating to me as... Because, first of all, I will say this is my, my first big complaint about Warbreaker and the thing that made me not enjoy it as much my first read is the fact that it started with Vasher. And then we got Vivina and Siri for a bunch of chapters. And it started off with a bang. It started off with Vasher just showing up with no breasts. And then by the time he leaves, he's like had straw men jumping around. And he gets a guy who's just, you know, condemned to like, he gets him to give him his breasts. And so as that he'll pay- kill him. As payment will kill him. It's just like, this is not, um, like, this is a man who definitely lives in morally gray territory. Yes, yes. (laughs) And I want to know more about what he's doing. And then it's like, and now the two princesses. And I'm like, what? No, 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 no. like mountainside village where they're talking about all sorts of random things. Yeah, I'm like, no, go back to the guy with the talking sword that was, that was pleasantly evil. What's going on? Yeah, especially because, uh. Didn't you see Vivina as basically Serene 2.0? Yeah, that's what she was to me. <laughs> so, <laughs> it, it's just, it, The other thing, just to let everyone understand, to, that I read this book in Hawaii, and the reason I read it in Hawaii was because I horribly burned my feet. Like, second-degree birds sunburn on my feet. Somehow... On the bottom of your feet, No, it? no, no, it was the top of the feet. Okay. But my okay. feet swole, swole up. Swelled up? Sw- I don't Swelled. know. Swelled up, Swelled up so so big it felt like I'd sprained both ankles and they were burned. And so while everyone else was doing stuff in Hawaii in my family, I was re- reading Warbreaker. And so I may have been a bit testy because <laughs> my feet basically were having to be bathed in aloe vera. And so every time I'm sitting here having to s- suffer through Vivina being dumb, I'm just like, man, a stupid Vivina, my feet hurt. <laughs> And I may have blamed her. Uh, it's really it's not her fault. her fault. Right, rightly so. Yeah. And so when she was being dumb, and I felt it was obvious she was being dumb, it bugged me probably a lot more than it should have. That said, <laughs> through the second reading, it still really bugged me. <laughs> and up up until she finally got out of the... It, once she got up with Va- Vasher, mm-hmm. I, like, her, her character, I, I think, really took off, and I didn't mind her very opinionated ways that much right but that was when she was starting to transition too and, yeah and coming to accept things more well and but the other thing with about vasher that i liked is i liked how he he's very aware of what his weaknesses are mm-hmm. and that's not a character that i think up until this point Brandon had really delved too much into. Uh, Vin and Kelsey are, are very self-confident. Ellen, mm-hmm. to some extent, understands what his weaknesses are, but he's he's plagued by indecision. And so right. there was a lot of navel-gazing with Ellen. Vasher is confident in what he's good at, but also aware of what he's bad at. Mm-hmm. But he's so driven that he's not going to let that stop him from doing what he thinks needs to be done. Well, it's like he realizes he's not the best swordsman of the group, but he figures out tricks to win sword fights. 
Oh, and yeah, okay, and I will say too. it was it's one a, of it was one of the best foreshadowed things in this book. There was some weak foreshadowing in this book, uh-huh. but how he won versus death was very well foreshadowed. Yes, and when he pulled it off, I was just like, "Ooh, that's fighting awesomely dirty and expensive." That was an expensive yeah. trick. That would only work against one opponent. If you had more than yeah. one, then you'd be uh-huh. well, now. That said. It's it's interesting because we see that he's not the best swordsman of the group, and yet when we see him on Roshar, what is he doing? He's teaching swordsmanship. He's te- he's <laughs> he's a sword trainer because and he's mm-hmm. one of the best swordsmen. You know, sword artists. Teach art. Artists, I think, is what they're called. He's one of the best teachers of swordsmanship. Yeah, out there. Well, and it's, so it's, it's one of those things. So maybe he's not as good as Dent and Arsteel. Exactly. Okay. But he's the, still good. <laughs> the the other this is not Vasher, but it's Nightblood. The other thing I love about Nightblood is how he just assumes everyone knows everyone. And when Vivid when Vivin is trying to sneak around with Nightblood and she gets caught and he's just like, You're no better at this than Vasher is. Yes, Steel would be very disappointed in you, as if she has any clue who uh-huh. that is. And I just, I, I don't know, I love how he just assumes everyone knows each other, and he also assumes everyone likes him. Like, like, yeah. Because yeah, when, cause when Vivida gets him out of the, it was like some warehouse or whatever, yeah, and she's like, Va- Vartrelides threw me in the ocean. I thought he liked me. And it's like, Death has said nothing but negative things about him the entire time. Oh my gosh, I just realized something. I realized who um, Nightblood reminds me of. He reminds me of my nephew, who is one of the most self-confident, charismatic kids in the world. He just walks up up to people and he's like, we're going to be best friends because trust me, I'm that awesome. <laughs> and, so, <laughs> and that's just sort of the, the mindset that Nightblood has. I love it. Uh, I see that. So I did find the quote. Okay. Um, but it, it's kind of a long one, but it's, I think them describing that if he gave away his breath, um, he could survive. Okay. He has two sources. He has his innate divine breath. That makes him a returned. And then the others is the one given into him is the treasure of peace giver, which is a 50,000. And then. I'm sorry. Um, it was 50,000. I missed that 50, number. 50,000. And that he could use as any Awakener could, as long as he is careful about the commands he uses. Um, let's see, he could also survive without it, as long as he used the ones that he was given. Like, the extra ones every week that he was given. Yeah. So that's that's what I was remembering, was that part. So. Yeah. Okay. I could have sworn there was some other line about him surviving past otherwise, but that's, yeah, and that's I, the I don't know. Found. Okay. So. Um, so, uh, so we've talked about Vasher. Let's talk a little bit about Vivina. Um, just because, you know, at the end of the book, they sort of go off, right off into the sunset for looking for Strolling adventures. Through the and, forest, you know. Uh huh. It's it, it it it's very much the you know end of the movie. The music starts playing, and they're like off to the next adventure, and you know, that's how I've always sort of whatever seen yes deals up to. Yeah. Yeah. And it's just like you know, and then the music plays. To be continued comes across the street, the screen, and so the one thing I like about Vivida at the end of the book is she has mm-hmm. sort of picked up her lessons from both Denth and Vasher. She's mm-hmm. be- like so. Mm-hmm. One of the things that's fun about Denth, Denth understands he's in a storybook, like because he has the moment where Vasher like gets thrown off the roof, and there's like, do you think he lived? He's like, he just fell off a three story building to a certain doom. Of course, he survived. <laughs> I almost think right. it's more he's Not just so savvy. used to Vasher just not dying. He's the guy yeah. that will not die. It's always just like That's true. he's yeah. gonna survive it somehow. But it's, it's Vasher. He's gonna at do the, it. At the end of the, the one of the things she asked Vasher at the end, he's like, Yes, Steel did this. She's like, Yes, Steel. I'm assuming he's related to our Steel. He's, he's like, Yeah, he's his brother. The guy you killed? Yeah. Of course. <laughs> like and she's just sort of like, <laughs> like It reminds me of Emperor's new groove, but it's like sharp rocks at the bottom. <laughs> most likely. <laughs> Bring it on. Bring it on. <laughs> I just love, I, I love that at the end of the book, she understands that she's now, well, because at this point she understands who she's with. That mm-hmm. it's a guy who has been bo- both peace giver, both, you know, Kalad, Vasher, just all these different things. And she understands, mm-hmm. 
yeah, I'm now stepping into some some weird territory I was not planning on. So yeah. I'm just going to roll like, with this. But she, mm-hmm. but she knows she can't fit back into the box that she was in. Yeah, she right. She wouldn't be the perfect daughter that her father wants anymore. She can't be the princess because they're probably going to look at her and think that she's... Um, still living a... Well, still live in it, and that she's that she has all this breath now, and she's a horrible person, you know, and she's got yeah. all these problems or whatever else, and so she knows that the mindset that she would be stepping back into and around. Well, it. the other thing she realizes yeah. now that's interesting is she comes to the realization that she's not important anymore, mm-hmm. and she's okay with that. Which yeah, is, and that's a big step to be like, I used to be up and really important, and all of a sudden I'm not. And suddenly not she under anymore. suddenly she understands Syria a bit better. Because Siri loved that, and that was what she loved about her life. And suddenly, Vivian is just like, "Oh, this is kind of nice. I don't have." Yeah, to... like suddenly, I, I'm not important, which means I'm not going to disappoint anybody. Well, and now talk... you know she's been living with that anxiety, just balled up inside that her her entire life. Time, yeah. that, that's an interesting thing you uh, you point out there because it was sort of she talked like she had that big epic uh, tantrum where she talked about how she hated Hallandra and how her entire life was built up to this and now that you know now it's taken away and all this mm-hmm. all this stuff and it's she's now come out the other side of this realizing yes my entire life's purpose the thing i'm building up to has been taken away but she now sees that as i have no responsibility i can do whatever i want with it mm-hmm. and before that especially her cuz she was such a dutiful child who was always ready to do whatever needed to be done, not having a very clear path was catastrophic to her because her whole life had been planned. Mm. It's interesting when you look at birth order studies, um, you know, she is the stereotypical oldest child, the one who is following all the rules, the one who is almost a second parent or an additional parent to the kids below. And she's just always following the exact path that's set out for it. You know, it's not always the case, but she fits into that mold very just cleanly. Mm-hmm. So. I always think of her brother as being older, but I guess he's not, but since he's mm-hmm. a boy, he's, he's but the he's the male heir. And yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. So let's move on to light song. So one thing that I, it, I, I wasn't a big fan of Light Song the first time I read it. It just, to me, it felt like Brandon was trying too hard. Um, I think the, stuff. yeah, and I think the thing that kind of fixed it for me was when I read something that Brandon described. He said, um, "Light Song is written to be somebody who would fit in well in an Oscar Wilde play," mm-hmm. and and it's just that that very glib, flippant type of conversation and suddenly it fit a little bit better to me um yeah. when just reading it without that context i felt okay brandon you're trying too hard you're trying to be funny and not quite getting there but seeing more what he was reaching for i think he did a better job than i at first assumed um I, now i think that's sort of an unpopular opinion because most people i talk to say oh i love light song he's my he's the best part of the book what about what are y'all what are y'all's thoughts um, I really liked it, but he, he would get tiring after a while, like, and it would, cause it would make me have to think a little bit harder in their conversations. Cause there's so many puns and twists and I'm not always the best at picking up on those. Like, and I, I fully admit that. Mm-hmm. And so I liked his conversations, especially with like blush weaver and stuff. Cause that's when he was most flippant and things like that. Right. But I almost had to do them in small doses because it was just a lot and sitting going, Oh wait, mm-hmm. so he's making that comparison. And then it, it would jolt me out of the story just a little bit if if there was too much of a stretch to the come to the pun or whatever else and i know in real life i would probably be the one who's always staring at him in confusion going Wait, what i missed that joke again it, and it would i would find him really irritating in real life i'm sure but i i generally enjoyed him and i liked how earnest he was about wanting like he was, he he was flippant because he knew that he was unimportant and he was useless. And he knew that he was wasting all the potential that he'd been given. Mm-hmm. And he's I mean, and he was just sitting there going, and I'm getting all this stuff, and what am I doing with it? And then people are asking me to kill myself every week. So that's kind of a horrible existence in some way. Well, and you know, in his mind, he's th- saying, you know, my point of existing 
is to kill myself. Mm-hmm. And I don't want to do that. And he's thinking, so if I'm ignoring my reason for being for myself, that makes me a selfish coward. Mm-hmm. But And his name is Lies on the Brave. Mm-hmm. So it's an extra, it feels like hypocrisy to him. And I like that he thinks it's hypocrisy because the thing that is, I can't remember who pointed it out. Uh, it was mm, All Mother, I think it was. Um, who pointed out that he's the one who listened, like, lit, like, actually sat there and considered the artwork he was looking at and mm-hmm. would listen to the petitions. And he felt like a hypocrite because he he didn't believe in his own divinity. And it's and so, like, it's understandable, but he still took his duties, his duties seriously, even though he didn't feel he did. And that's sort right. of more, that's a real big condemnation on the other gods, where he, you know, he's the one who's taken it all seriously, even though he doesn't, be, you know, he's not sitting there believing his own press. But yeah. the thing that I loved was, because I'll be honest, like, when he was being flippant, I did not find him very funny. What mm-hmm. I did find funny is, some, he had some funny lines, uh, but in particular, how he would do things to purposely, not when he's like being glib, but sort of just to annoy his priests, mm-hmm. like not not, but in a fun way. Like he's just tro- oh, he's when just, he's trolling them. Yeah, and I don't know. I liked those moments, especially once you realize that it's his brother that he's doing it to, uh-huh. and it's like, oh, it's second nature because it's and his he, brother. And he, and he kept wondering, he's like, why doesn't he get more mad about well, things that it's like? But it's your brother who what? totally adores you and, and knows what you were and all this other stuff. And, and he knows he's like, I, this is my well, that's, weird. <laughs> that's the other thing is, um, you know, he, because Laramar isn't responding, he's just like, where is the line? You know, like how far do I have to push him to get a reaction? Mm-hmm. And it just, he's, you know, so he's, it's almost a sick curiosity. He's like, what, when will he finally crack? Mm-hmm. And so the other thing that I liked about him, he's the only one who sat there and was curious enough to start actually asking questions. Mm-hmm. Just, and that's the part that everyone else was severely lacking. Just mm-hmm. the curious nature, uh, like everyone else, like they have all their fineries and they're just like, oh, things are good. And I loved when he was playing his his game. The, I can't remember what it was where they oh, where they're like throwing big rocks or yeah. balls off of a off of it. And I just love I, I love that he's balcony. winning. He's winning despite not knowing the strategy, and he's figured mm-hmm. out that like he's purposely not taught himself the rules because he keeps winning and, and he's trying to learn the rules as he you know he's like, yeah if I do it this way, what happens? Yeah, and, so... and he does, but he doesn't want to learn the rules because he's learned not knowing the rules has made him better at it. It's one of those things where... I can't it's, overthink. Yeah, well, and I found it funny because he, he says to himself in his head, it's like, you know, the fact that he keeps winning despite not knowing the rules is probably the biggest condemnation <laughs> of the the supposed skill this game takes. Right. And I laugh because, you know, there are, are games where it's like, huh, so if I just mash the buttons, I still uh, I still win? And, oh, yeah. that's, that's a condemnation of this game. <laughs> Well, it's like uh, I have a nephew who, when he was two years old, that's when the, the original Wii came out, and he was doing Wii boxing against my brother-in-law, and he was just getting up there and flailing his hands, and my brother-in-law was trying you know, to, to play right, and every single time, he just completely <laughs> destroyed my brother-in-law, and, it, he was, and he was getting so mad, because it's this two-year-old who's flailing, and yet he's the one who's winning. <laughs> Yeah, I would make my brothers really frustrated because it would be Mortal Kombat on the Sega uh-huh. Genesis. And I would just find one random button mash combo and just do the the cheap move over and over and over again. And they would... I wouldn't always win, but I would win more than they would like just by doing the cheap sliding move or the get over here or whatever. I can't remember on you. It's know, like Jordan, you know, but... Uh, we have a friend who went to a Smash Brothers tournament. And you remember the people who regularly went to these tournaments got mad because they were playing wrong and so they were winning because yeah that was a very specific they they played their own way and it specifically counters the regular meta it's not it's uh-huh. not it's not repeatable like and they didn't win with it 
but it causes right. problems. Mm-hmm. And because they play wrong, it frustrates them. And it's hilarious. Right. But, no, th- but the thing that I found interesting is how Light Song doesn't play the political games, but even he sits there as they're like, oh, my plans are already go- coming to fruition, blah, blah, blah. And Light Song's just like, yeah, I kind of doubt that. Like, you know, just sort of just like, no, you guys are kind of not very smart. So He's like, I'm, I'm not going to play your game because your game's ridiculous. And he would he would tweak rules and different things and, like, go through the little loopholes that were left, like, because he wanted to go investigate and he used the squirrel. Or he, and he wanted to use the squirrel. Like, yes. The squirrel from the and they're like, oh, well, you're not allowed here. And he's like, well, you're not allowed to tell me no, though. And they're like, no, you're... And so he would do it anyway. The fact and that he annoyed all mother to the point uh-huh. of just letting him in. He like par- he like camped out in front of her place and just like mm-hmm. said just Well, and the just... the fact that the 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 peace de resistance is just like and here's my squirrel of annoyance. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the sun and the squirrel. It's just like, man, that's that's a good move. <laughs> Well, the, yeah. the other thing that's interesting about Light Song to me is the context that he's presented in. Because, again, according to Brandon, in the past generations, the returned have have largely been very selfless. Um, and he just said, this is kind of just a bad batch. And Light Song recognizes that. You know, he looks around and there, he, he even comments on it. He's like, the best of us gave themselves up years ago. And it's just really interesting seeing how he sees himself and he compares himself to these previous generations who are very selfless. But if you look at him in comparison to the current generation, he's the best of them. But he doesn't see that. He sees, this is what I'm lacking. And he's reminded of that. Like, I think Blushweaver comments and says, you are the best of us and like is constantly Mm -hmm. getting after him for it. And he's just like, no, I'm not. And he, he refuses to see it in himself. And if you think about it, it's also if your system of government is set up on the backs of a race that has to kill themselves to do the the big thing, mm-hmm. it would naturally tend towards selfish selfishness because the selfish ones are going to live longer, right? Yeah. And so, like, I think I think it's also sort of Brandon pointing out the inherent flaw in the system. Yeah. And so. Oh, it really is an interesting political system that he set up in this one. It's which so I convoluted. Read, I don't typically read Brandon for political intrigue, but this one, he does a great job with it. Yeah. It, and so. The only issue I really take with it is, and this is getting to just the worst written character in most of Brandon's books, which is Blush Weaver. Um, I hate her, and she's horribly <laughs> written, and she's a problem. She's I just a pro- think of her as, as an anime girl who's who's all about her looks, and then you throw in some politics. See, and I and, see a di- completely different character, because I see a, a deep character who's basically trying to live up to expectations. She, she's basically a female version of Light Song, in my opinion, except even more so. Except this is, this is my problem with that comparison. Light Song completely understands that he's out of his depth in playing these games, but he plays them because he feels an obligation. She severely wants the adoration. She really does. Like, she's sitting here wanting the right commands, and she has convinced herself that the Idrians are an issue. And you can see it anytime she talks about how, you know, oh, they sent, you know, an assassin, and how she treats Siri and just like oh yeah it's like you mm. put, don't go near my man or whatever like that yeah to which it's just like she she I'm thinks getting that, territorial with the, the queen of everything i know yeah well and it, yeah. it just it bugs me because she's supposed to be the god of interpersonal relationships and she reads everything completely wrong and that it, like that's what annoys me about her is she thinks she knows everything and she's this master political uh manipulator and I've, I just, I'm, it's just one of these things like Brandon writes her like, and everyone says, oh, she's really good at this manipulations. And I'm just like, I don't see it. And she's manipulated every turn. So how is she good? See, and that's not how I read it. So I, I, I didn't read her as she, as Brandon's writing her as actually being good at this. Because again, in the end, 
she is 100% blindsided and pays the ultimate price for it. Yeah. But everyone else, like the other gods, talk about her as if she is. But again, this is the really not the greatest person. crop yeah. of gods. Yeah. But, but I'm not talking about like the selflessness. I'm just talking about like they see her as she is brilliant politically. And at no point did I see any moves that say, yeah, she is. She's good at this. But a part of that is also that the other um, returned... They're not really paying attention to politics, so it's the kind of thing. It's the kind of thing where they're just believing in the inform. Oh, everybody says that she's great at politics, so clearly she's great at politics. It and almost injury. it feels like the queen bee thing in high school, like a little bit, which I never really was close to or anything like that. I was kind of like the weird bop between the clicks type thing, and I was got along with most people. Like I hung out with the scary people in the black trench coats, and I wasn't one of them, but I hung out with them a lot because they were my Japanese class. Uh-huh. But um, but yeah, I that kind of reminds me of like the stereotypical mean girl, queen girl, you know, leader right. type thing. And Regina the, George. And I will completely just say, her constant innuendo was just annoying. Oh. It wasn't. It was just. Yeah. I don't see how. I don't see it as interesting. And I it don't was see too it as... blatant and too. It was too much because if you're gonna do innuendo, you need to do it with a lighter touch. She just was like pounding you in the head. Like, that's the thing I find interesting. Siri got naked, was sitting there faking intercourse, and at one point has intercourse. It's the closest Brandon has ever gotten to actually writing scenes like that. Yet and somehow, it's, 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 yet it's, somehow, it's, Blush Weaver was the more blatant parts of the book. <laughs> of that. Mm-hmm. And it's just <laughs> yeah. I just, I don't know. It annoyed me. It's just, everything You're about her character grates against me. And I will, I'm not, I I don't complain. When she died, I'm just, good. <laughs> just, that was all. I was happy, and I don't have to deal with her anymore. Huzzah. All right, well, in, on that note, then let's move on to Dent and Tonkfa. I don't think, not just Dent and Tonkfa, Dent, Tonkfa, Jules, and... And Parlin. Parlin. And um, okay, this, this is something I've been <laughs> meaning to talk about. The hat he describes for Parlin. That's Link's hat, right? Am I crazy? Oh, no. He described I like think so. That's kind of how I imagined it. And he keeps pointing out how stupid it looks, and I'm like, I think he's, <laughs> I think he's taking swipes at Legend of Zelda here. I think that's what he's doing. I'll have to reread because I, I just let the description of the hat go i was like but i'm not gonna focus the on entire hat. okay we move on i just imagine yeah, that, that, that's what i imagine too so. i imagine link the entire time because he also doesn't talk much and he's like a <laughs> hunter and i don't like it, I, it's, I, I, I just really expected him to start though, breaking though. pots at a certain point it just <sighs> i really i really did like that there was more depth to parlin not that you got to see a lot of it because it was all from vivenna's point of view yeah but when he was he like, oh, well, I like, he's like, well, I like Jules. And he's like, you obviously don't like me. And he's like, so what's even the point of, you know, pretending or, or whatever else? And like, she starts to treat him like, well, you, you like me and we're sort of betrothed and whatever else. And he's like, no, I kind of gave up on that a while ago because obviously you treat me like crap. So why would I uh-huh. want to continue that relationship that way? Well, what was his line? If something like, and he's like, I know I'm not very smart, but you don't have to make me feel stupid. Yeah. That, yeah, that's what it was. It's, it's, she would make him feel stupid all the time because she was kind of self righteous in what she was. In it was just like, like he said that. It's just like, ooh, okay, well, that uh, just do, okay? Need some aloe vera for that? Yeah. <laughs> well, and I've had moments like that. Like, there was a, you know, back in the day, there was a girl I was interested in, and then she wasn't interested, and I got over it, but for months after that if not years she just assumed that anything i did was in the time in in the frame of reference of oh you know he's in love with me i'm just like dude i got over it now let me be over it and so it's yeah he's but yeah and so parlin's response to that i'm just like dude i I feel you on that (laughs) so and then he gets tortured Oh, that's off screen. That that was sad. Yeah, well, and that was another, you know, we were talking about sudden, oh, they're dead moments. Like, we Mm -hmm. we talked about that with Kalsir, where it just sort of blink and you have to look back. Same thing happened when Parlin, you know, 
when she saw him, I'm just like, wait, what? But he wasn't. He he's not supposed to die. You you broke a rule. And it, it but, kind of felt a little bit more real in the fact of if she probably was in shock. That that's mm-hmm. kind of the way your brain works is your brain can't handle the information, so it sees it, but it doesn't comprehend it, and it just absolutely keeps moving, and you have to keep taking in all the other data, and yeah. It's just a surreal experience when you are in shock. I don't know. Have you guys ever been in shock? No. Yes. Yes. I, I did once. Well, I went over the, the handlebars of my bike, which I still haven't really ridden a bike much since then. But it was a really weird experience. Like, I remember I, I got lucky in that there was, like, a cop right behind me. I wasn't hurt that bad. I mean, I scraped. I got some um, road rash on my hands and stuff like that. But, like, my husband managed to get there, too, and... and they asked me, oh, do you want to take an ambulance to the to the hospital? And I look up at my husband, and I'm like, totally not even understanding anything. And I'm like, do I want to take an ambulance? <laughs> like, oh. I just, it's childlike, and I couldn't comprehend things. To me, it feels like, have you ever been riding a bike, and the chain slips off the gears? It's been and a so long you're, time. And so you're pedaling, but it's not doing anything. That's how it feels like, you know, your brain works when you're in that kind of shock. Because it feels yeah. like it's going a mile a minute. But mm-hmm. nothing is catching, and so it's not moving anything. Yeah, that's a better analogy than I had. That's good. So but yeah, so I I kind of think of the writing style in that way, in that, in that she's kind of in shock, and so she's it's just happening, and she can't process it, and so the reader can't really process it very well either because you're following along on her point of view. Right. the The thing about that scene is it's sort of a weird. And Bill and I have discussed this before. I feel Tonkfa being this sociopathic uh, sadist or whatever, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. that part is well foreshadowed. Yeah. I think Dense we talked be- about that last time. With, without being telegraphed. Yeah. yeah. Dense betrayal felt sort of out of left field to me. Well, the thing is, you know, and Brandon has sort of explained it this way too, you know, he said that, oh, you know, he keeps talking about how mercenaries are traitors and stuff. And, and the frustrating thing is, no, he doesn't talk about that. He talks about how they're not. Because he talks he, about how... Now, everyone else sees it this way. But really, and, and honestly, I, he makes some good points. Mm-hmm. And so for for it to just be an absolute betrayal, it's just like, well... It felt more. It felt kind of like we were being betrayed by Brandon in, some, in, a, in a bit. I, I will say, this, is, this book, he, he, I think, was weaker on a lot of his foreshadowing. Because that... Dense betrayal didn't feel correct to me, and mm-hmm. but Blue Fingers being the the big bad felt completely out of right field because he mentions the 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 Con Paul situation two three maybe four times in the entire book. Con Paul or Pon Paul? What did I say? I said Con Paul. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. Spoonerisms are fun. Anyway. Um, Yesterday was Spoonerism Day. Really. There's all sorts of holidays I don't know about. Dang it, I need to mark that on the calendar. That'd be a good one. Anyway, um, like, it just felt so out of left field. Like, yeah. don't get me wrong. Like, once you stack everything up, okay, yeah, sure. But it needed more foreshadowing. And that's something that Brandon has, himself has actually spoken on. They said, you know, oh, okay. what is your biggest problem? And he said, I should have talked more about the punk call. Yeah, because when they when Bluefingers was suddenly the traitor, it's just like, wait, what? what? <laughs> yeah, I remember even rereading it. I was like, I know somebody's a traitor that I'm not going to expect, but I can't remember who it is. And then it, it wasn't until like right before it that I was like, that's who it is. That's right. And well, it's just because it could have been through me. It could have been amazing. Because how often is it the evil accountants? It's never the evil accountants. <laughs> I know. And that would have been great, but just it just it was lacking it and. I don't know. I think, Dent still yeah. worked for me, but I think I talked about this last time, but it, I also was looking for it the whole time. And so I probably was picking up little teeny things that were not probably well fleshed out, but I fleshed them out in my head because I was looking for that. Because I, I remember that trail <coughs> really distinctly. Yeah, right. I, 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 I was looking for it too, and I still felt it wasn't very... It wasn't very... Er- Dent's part of it. Tonkfa, right. completely. Like, that felt mm-hmm. just fine. Um, Jules was also very interesting because she's the only person who they really portray as the, a believer of the the, the colors or whatever you the haladrin call. religion, the iridescent tomes. Yeah, like she's right. the only one, 
And she gets on Vivida, gives her an She's kind of a, about it too, an yeah. epic yeah. smackdown. <laughs> like it was sort of like, whew, okay, didn't expect this. Also, didn't I mean, expect you... Vivina to like put her hand on her shoulder. I understand. To which I'm just like, oh, you are. Do you are just <laughs> asked for a horrible, horrible beating. You aren't good with this, are you? Your yeah. tutors did not train you very well when it comes to other people having different beliefs, did you? Yeah, yeah. diversity, not a Adrian thing. No, it's not. No, I it was it's kind of a weird thing because you don't usually think of mercenaries as being very religious too. So that kind of was another thing yeah. that threw you is right. That it worked with a religion too because I mean it wasn't their moral area is a little more gray. It felt like, but well, and the thing that's interesting is that technically, you know, there you see two major religions with the the Pong call one is sort of a side third one, mm -hmm. and none of them are right. <laughs> It's just an interesting, you know, look because the, uh, the 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 iridescent tones, you know, they're probably the closest to right, but they're not gods. They're cognitive shadows. We find out, you know, they're they're pieces they're, of God. They're super sprint, is what they are. Yeah, but I mean, um, they don't they don't know about the other stuff. So. Yeah, right. Next but time. you know, and then Oster is completely off. Oh, yeah. uh, like I was listening to a uh, a Q and A with Brandon, where somebody at, you know they mentioned Oster is constantly referred to as male, and we know that Endowment, aka Edgley, who is the vessel of Endowment, is female. And Brandon yeah. said, <laughs> you know that that's true. And the other person said, so you know who is Oster? And Brandon, you know, gave his sort of mysterious grin, and then they said is Oster another return? And Brandon just said, that would be a very good guess. No answer beyond that. But and so it's just like, huh, I mean, who knows? Maybe Oster is also Vasher because he has a million <laughs> names anyway. And so <laughs> poor guy. And so of course, you know, which you think about it, that'd be an interesting situation for Vivina who suddenly, Oh, she's hanging out with her God. Yeah. He's no. a little bit different than she. They're just does. chilling, and he, and of course, she accuses him of blasphemy and all this stuff, mm -hmm. and he's the person that she's been. Born. I know we don't know if that's who it is or not, but I just well now like I want concept. it to be. It would be interesting, right? <laughs> no, oh man, yeah, it's interesting because we we know some good details about endowment, despite the fact that I don't think that word was even ever used in the book. No, it, I don't being in there. For, for the longest time, we only knew the shard on Nalthus as the voice. The voice that calls out to the return to bring oh, them that's back. that's right, yeah. Um, other than that, you know, the shard actually hadn't been referred to. Um, I mean, honestly, beyond uh, ruin and preservation, we didn't really know what a shard was yeah. still. Because Brandon hadn't talked much about it at this point. But... Um, you know, so most of the stuff we know about endowment comes from more of Brandon stuff. To the point where even uh, like a lot of the uh, extra stuff that we've gotten from the other books came from uh, what's it called? Uh, Epigrams. I can't even bound it. Oh. But Nalthus is the only shard world that doesn't have a short story in that book, which means it doesn't have an essay. You know, because there's always, like, I mentioned Chris, I think yeah. it was. Yeah, Chris has the essays on each one, but, yeah, there's mm -hmm. no short But since story. there's no story in Nalthus, and Brandon has actually said several times he's intending to do it. He wanted to write one, write it and publish it with uh, the paperback version of um, Arcanum Unbounded. Didn't happen. He was thinking about doing it around Oathbringer. Didn't happen. So he's continuing to work on it. It's just, and he's planning on having an essay for Nalthus, but it's just not there yet. Then, yeah, yeah. So most of the stuff we know, though, has come from interviews and Q&As and stuff like that. One thing that is interesting, and it's from Oathbringer, one of the letters that is to Hoyd, uh, most of the community agrees. One, There's this one in particular that most of the community thinks it's from Endowment. Okay. Um, and in it... Which she, one? Uh, it's She talks to Hoyd about how... Uh, you, uh, you know, we agreed 
when we we made our pact to not interfere with one another and i'm kind of disappointed to see how basically i'm the only one who is following mm-hmm. through with that because uh, uh dominion and devotion went off together ruin and preservation went off together autonomy's interfering with everyone and it's hilarious because of his name and then uh, there's a shark party going on on roshar yeah and then roshar and there's all <laughs> sorts of messed up stuff going on and so it basically that was sort of and that makes a lot of sense uh just sort of given what's going on on her planet where she's sort of just doing her own little thing and mm-hmm. she's just like looking everywhere else just being like what are these idiots doing? We we had we agreed on something. There were some simple rules that nobody followed them but me. Am I the only one who read the rule book? It's in the rule book. Yeah. Uh, okay, so what do we know about endowment? Again, we know she's female. We know her name was Edgley. We know her name was Edgley. So, you know, if you see the flowers, the tears of Edgley they talk about that grow in Halandrin and make the amazing dyes... Those are the tears of Edgley. Now, I, I'm, I'm curious. Do y'all have any suspicions? Because, like, I've, I've seen a theory that the tears of Edgley are essentially the adium for her. I have not seen much word of Brandon about this at all. You yeah, guys have a lot more word of Brandon. So this is all new to me. Like, I really uh-huh. know it's going, oh, that's good to know. I feel like I should know more of this. I mean, it's, I just a, it's just a theory Yeah. Um, that people... Uh, pointed out. Uh, it's, it, it feels like it could work to me, but I also am still dipping my toes into the waters of all of the craziness <laughs> that is the Cosmere in that way. So. No, and then there's a lot of speculation right now, of course. And Brandon, I think, has said if you look for it, you can figure it out of where her shard pool is. Now, I have two theories. One, of course, is beneath the jungle where the tears of Edgley are growing. The other is the they grow right. They just grow in the one location. Mm-hmm. And then the other is the sea itself, which is known as the Bright Sea. You know, and that's just sort of a thought. Hey, Bright Sea. Maybe it glows sometimes. Maybe it's mm-hmm. special. And maybe the waters of the Bright Sea are what make it so that the tears of Edgley grow nearby. Mm-hmm. But just some, just some thoughts. Do Do you guys want me to read the the letter that people think is from endowment? Go ahead. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Dearest Sephandrius, which we know is one that's, of Hoy's names. That's one of the earliest names that he's used. Yeah. I received your communication, of course. I noticed its arrival immediately, just as I noticed your many intrusions into my land. You think yourself so clever, but my eyes are not those of some petty noble to be clouded by a false nose and some dirt on the cheeks. You mustn't worry yourself about Rays, who is Odium. It's a pity about Aeona and Skye, but they were foolish, violating our pact from the beginning. Your skills are admirable, but you're merely a man. You had your chance to be more and refused it. No good can come of two shards settling in one location. It was agreed that we would not interfere with one another, and it disappoints me that so few of the shards have kept this, to this original agreement. As for Uli Da, which we know is... Uh, uh, is that ambition? Ambition, yes. Uh, that's the shadows of self world. It was obvious from the outset that she was going to be a problem. Good riddance. Regardless, this is not your concern. You turned your back on divinity. If race becomes an issue, he will be dealt with, and so will you. <laughs> so, yeah. endowment is not putting up with everyone else. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um. You. You said uh, shadows or stuff. You mean shadows for silence? Or oh, sorry, dang it. Okay. See, I just, do not do well. Sure yes, now, so. I do not do well with the fact that he has a book called Shadows of Self, and there's shadows for silence in the forests of hell, yes. which I'm excited to talk about because like I'm, that, I'm that, that was a hard one. My picture for that one. I've got a really cool idea for that one. Ooh. I'm hoping it turns out really good. So anyway, one other thing that's interesting that another it's again it's speculation, but. Um, there's a scene, I, I can't remember if it's in uh, Oathbringer or in Words of Radiance, where um, she's talking to, where, what's her name, Shalon is talking to Mraes, mm-hmm. and she's in a room and he's got like all his little trophies around, 
and there's and if you look closely at a, the little descriptions you can pin certain ones and at one point he's got she sees a vial i believe where there's a flower suspended in liquid and a lot of people suspect that it's a tear eventually i can't remember which book that's in that because it the, it's either the second or third one. It's, it's, so se- it's the second one. I think it's the second one. It's the second one, because that's the one where Shalon starts dealing with the ghost bloods. Mm-hmm. That's right, yeah, she gets more. I need to restart my, my reread of Stormlight. Yeah. yeah. It's, gonna it's okay. It's yeah. only, you know, you have two weeks. <laughs> the audiobook's only 40 hours. So. Yeah, I mean, that's just... <laughs> Guys, it's one of those things where I'm grateful. I'm grateful for a job with data entry because I can <laughs> listen to a few hours of a book and be okay. But man, oh, it's so long to get through those books. It mm-hmm. is, and I and I for my reread to, to do Oathbringer, I didn't even reread the first one. I just read summaries of it because I was like, "There's no way I'm gonna have time to read the first one and the second one, and then get to Oathbringer in a reasonable amount of time." Right. And I, I need to actually read it this time. Oh man, <laughs> scary. One of, so oh, so, so one of the other things that was interesting that you pointed out to me, Bill, in a side conversation is the fact yeah. that the returned are actually splinters. Yes. So um, that's one of the things that's interesting is the way that it works is endowment is actually consciously splintering herself in the way that um, previous that. For example, that on other shard worlds, other shards have been splintered. On Cell, uh, Dominion and Devotion have been splintered to the point of complete, completely being dead and merging together. On Roshar, Honor has been splintered, again, by, um, by Odium. And in this one, she's actually intentionally splintering parts of herself to send that power into the return to give them a, a divine breath and the chance to live again and work and it, it's just an interesting concept because she that means that she is actually more directly interfering with human lives than any of the other shards mm-hmm. because she is like they're dying and she is chopping off little bits of herself to bring them back to life I wonder does she get the little bits back when they die again I don't know we we know so, we know so little about any of the processes because mm-hmm. we we haven't gotten like the only thing we have from her perspective is that letter i read potentially like that still might not be her yeah. but uh it's just one of those things where we we don't understand the process of what we do what she does right. the one thing we do know from a word of brandon is that she's okay with the returned uh eating breaths yes uh brandon did confirm that so well, cause, and yeah, because the the breaths aren't really the soul that the Idrians believe it is. It's just a, an extra bit of investiture mm-hmm. they have. And so, um, the other thing that's interesting, because we've talked about how the returned are splinters, you know, which is essentially a cognitive shadow. They work though in the exact opposite way. Because again, spoiler alert, spoiler alert, spoiler alert. Kelsier in Secret History is a cognitive shadow, we've been told. Mm-hmm. Kelsier is a mind without a body. The returned, it's their body, but they have no memory of who they were before. But so they just, but they do have memory, but it's all yes. it's all on the subconscious level. That's the right. Yeah, the it's int- almost like tactile memory and things like that. And mm-hmm. it's what's interesting about that. And I, I and it's what I found the most interesting part of the Light Song chapters as he's sitting there trying to figure out who he was from what individual sets of skill. Like when he just starts juggling and he's like, he's like I can juggle. He's like, Okay, so I can juggle. I'm good with numbers. How do those two relate? And, yeah. you know, and he's trying <laughs> to figure this out. What I find interesting about that is essentially what happens is their mind it, it seems like it's almost like it's it's loading a save state. It's suddenly they have all the skills of like a D and D character. It's got you know got got up to level eighteen, but all the backstory got wiped. It's like 
have you ever been playing a game and then set it aside and come back months later and tried to start playing again and you have no idea what's going on? One of my one of my personal favorite things <laughs> is seeing people sometimes post on Reddit. They log into their World of Warcraft account that they haven't opened <laughs> in years and seeing what's in their bags. Yep. And it's just there's items that like are now completely useless. They don't even exist anymore. But you don't want to get rid of it because dude, you've got something that doesn't, doesn't exist, exist anymore. anymore. And it's sort of like that, where they have all the skills, they just don't have any of the the relative story that brought them to those skills. Mm -hmm. And it's you wonder, what is it about the return process that does this? Mm -hmm. And and the the biggest question I have, are they that person? Yeah. Like, that's, that's the biggest question. Are they that person? Or are they, again, just sort of an echo of them? Yeah, because we know we know through uh, through secret history that a person dies, their cognitive shadow remains attached to the plane for a bit of time, and then gets pulled off into the beyond. Spiritual. And we have no clue, we have no clue what what goes What's on there? over there. And Brandon doesn't seem like he's going to be talking about it anytime soon, if ever. Yeah, it and... sounds like he doesn't want to. Nope. And I like that. But and so here's the question is cuz they return it seems it's pretty quickly after death, right? Yeah. Yes. I think cuz it, it seemed like Laramere Lar said Well, cuz they pulled him out. And yeah. then and then he did it. So yeah. It was and so you wonder is it getting the divine breath? Does that suck their I guess what we would call the Bring soul back. back in or is this you basically jump started the brain and this is a new person but because it's using the same brain case it mm -hmm. has all those skills because it's like, yeah it's like the ship of uh what's it called oh it's uh, the, the the ship the, the ship the ship paradox yeah or or the the axe where if you have an axe and you replace the head and then later you replace the handle is it the same axe mm -hmm. It, it it also reminds me a little bit of um, Dollhouse. I don't know if you guys have seen mm -hmm. that. Like, I, I was actually can, thinking the exact same so you thing. You can have like chips that you like put in the skill sets, and then it's just you can program it. And like especially in the later season, that it gets really weird, and that people just like have sets and they just pop them in for I'm going to get into a fight, so I'm going to put in kung fu or whatever. I know kung fu. It is. I know kung fu now. So, oh. Anyway, that just reminded me of Dollhouse. Yeah, and that's yeah. to be if uh, Brandon does. Uh, uh, sequel to War to Warbreaker anytime he's, soon. He's and he's planning it. It's, 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 it's getting, getting close. Blood, right? That's that's one of my biggest questions that I still have is is it the same person? And I would love to see him explore that because Light Song figured out what was going on right before he sacrificed himself to save Cisebron and then. Mm -hmm. save the world by by extension which actually we didn't talk about that part that was a pretty cool moment oh, because the oh. thing i liked about it is he does pause just a moment to look at the captors and smile before saying <laughs> my life to yours my breath to yours and it's oh, just like it's it just the fact that he does take the time to smile to get one last little dig in just yeah. gotta twist the knife. The fi just the final a little. Joke. The final joke. He's like, it, it's the kind of thing. He's just like, I've got you. I finally, like, I finally figured it out. I understand everything, and you are going to lose. And it's yeah. in, the other thing that's interesting. All his little dreams led up to that moment, mm -hmm. and it, the, they were either they were either flashbacks to how he died, mm -hmm. or they're what he's going to end up doing. Yeah, and the thing that's interesting, he he ends thinking, "Holy crap, I am a god." Like mm -hmm. where he suddenly realizes, "Oh my goodness, I am divine." And in a way he is. Like well, again, if he he's a he's a splinter of yeah. a divinity. And so it's just one of those things you just don't know it's hard to know what is actually you know, what's tr what's true, but if there's one thing that does show it shows that endowment does give them some level of precognition mm -hmm. and we don't know to what level you know they actually have but it is there 
Yep. And it lends something to the idea that endowment is pretty good at this uh, this future seeing game. Mm -hmm. No, it's it's very. I'm really interested in seeing how Edgley plays into the greater Cosmere story. I, gosh, I can't wait until we get the layer of part now. Um, but yeah, or Dragonsteel rather, which is I think going to be a trilogy. Anyway. Um, but yeah, so before, so we, we should probably start wrapping up before we finish up though, as always, we want to thank our patrons, who make it possible for us to keep creating new episodes. Um, the show of course will continue to be free for everybody, but if you'd like to support us, even if you want to just give us a dollar or two per episode, um, you can go to patreon.com slash Cosmere studies, uh, by becoming a patron, you get immediate access to our discord channel. We've got a growing community there on Discord. You can also continue the discussion about the Cosmere with us and other fans of the show. Um, you also get bonus content like the 6-7, a collection of seven pieces of content that Jordan, Amy, and I find each week and want to share with our listeners. You also get early access to any bonus shows that we produce, automatic entry into any giveaways we have, like the one we had earlier today. Mm -hmm and more and of course the most important thing that you do though is you make it so that we can keep making the show you help us to continue making it you help us to grow it and hopefully you know even record more frequent episodes better audio quality with new equipment and just making it a better experience for our listeners and viewers um now let's move on to, to the personal projects that each of us has going on outside. We've talked a little bit about this at the beginning, but let's get into a little bit more specifics. Jordan, what have you got going on right now? Uh, I'm still doing my two Amiibo tournaments, Digital Cockfighting at its best, uh, Salty, the Seasonal Amiibo League of Team Invitational, and Slap, the, the Smash League of Amiibo Pairs. Uh, those are going to be Tuesday, Wednesday, and Saturday. Uh, Saturday is when we do our nostalgic commercials, and... <laughs> That included, Saturday morning smash. Yeah, Saturday morning smash is amazing. You you really should come to to twitch.tv slash splice stream on Saturday mornings because some of the nostalgic commercials are amazing. Uh one that Bill actually sent us, which was uh <laughs> what Grizzly Dance Cakes. Dance like this. Was, what what was it called? Grizzly Cakes? I think cake? it's Grizzly Cakes. Grizzly Cake. Oh no. It was just an absolute it, it was it was definitely everything about the <laughs> 90s that needed to die and did um it was wonderful oh it was it was it was glorious to behold how terrible it was uh yes all right so and what time does that stream start uh that would be 10 a.m mountain time on saturdays 6 p.m mountain time on tuesdays and wednesdays and Amy, how about you? What have you got going on these days? I am working on two costumes right now mostly. I'm trying to get them done because I have my Star Lord and I'm like almost, almost, almost done with the boots. Like I've I've learned the school of or the skill of how to skiv, I think is what it's called, leather, and that's where you take off some of like the edging. But I'm trying to do the whole level, like the whole layer for the straps. So I can get Sounds like on. something that happens in prison. <laughs> It does a little bit. Yeah, anyways, so I had to buy, like, a little tool and stuff to get it so I could get them skinny enough to get the buckles on. And I'm also working on Lady Tremaine, so I may have the ring here that you lovely podcasters can't hear or can't see. Um, <laughs> anyway, but I am also, and I have a wig that I'm going to have to dye because I couldn't get a gray one, so I have a white one that I'm going to figure out how to dye a wig. And then... I can't wait to see you with that wig on. It's going to be oh, so crazy, my. and I got my that contacts, and they're, like, so. scary green. I was tempted to wear them today, but I'm like, I don't want to scare people with these contacts. They're, like, super bright green. I'm guessing um, if people want to see that, they should follow your Instagram? Yes. I'm off, I'll <laughs> look at okay, look at that marketing. That was just smooth. Oh, it just smooth. slid it right in there. Am, it was like I butter. It was, now that you've so called sweet. attention to it. <laughs> anyway, so I'm on Instagram at coincidence underscore cosplay on Twitter at coincidence cosp or, and then on Facebook at coincidence cosplay and props. And then on Vero is coincidence cosplay as well. So you can find me lots of different ways and awesome. I post as much as I can. And it's not always super often, but I try because I have two little people that I have to chase. So 
Very cool. And when I'm not here, I continue to write board game reviews over at the Innkeeper's Table at www.innkeeperstable.com. I actually posted a new review today of a game called Orléans. Not Orleans, as Jordan likes to emphasize. It's how um, it's spelled, about, people. It's how it's it, spelled. It's about medieval France. It's a bag-building game. It's a, an engine-building mechanic. Really, really fun game. So you should go to innkeeperstable.com and check out that review. You can also find me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. All of those are at Innkeeper's Table. Um, if you've enjoyed the show, we would love it. Love it, lit, love it. If you would go to iTunes and give us a five-star review over there, um, that's probably the best way that you can help the show other than becoming a patron. By rating the show, it makes it easier for other people to find us when they're searching for us, and it helps us to build the community so that we can grow the show. Also, please make sure to share the podcast and the videos with other Brandon Sanderson fans that you know. Now, before we take off for the rest of uh, for and leave Nalthus, moving on to the Stormlight Archive next week, y'all have any final thoughts on Warbreaker? It's really pretty and colorful. I it like really it. is. And I'm totally going to try and make Night Blood someday, and I will post about it. It'll be great. How are you going to get gonna... breath? Yeah, I thought the exact same thing. I'm pretty sure questions. that this book is like a cautionary tale of why you shouldn't. He'll just be in an homage to Nightblood. Uh, okay. Because sure. the real one would be a problem to have in my household. I'd have drab <laughs> children. That would not even be drabs, actually. They'd be dead. But they're, but they're innocent, so they're not evil. Well, yeah, but if... So the Never of... ask a mother <laughs> if their children are innocent. Like, are you sure about that? <laughs> Did we talk about the three-and-a-half-year-old that's relapsed on his potty training again? I yes. saw you post about that. I am mm -hmm. so sorry. Uh, Body training, it sucks. Especially when you thought you were done a year ago. And it just keeps coming back. Yeah, that's fun rough. times. Uh, how about you, Jordan? Uh, I'm just gonna sit here and celebrate uh, the fact that we got to ten episodes. And thus, uh, you know uh, that we have staying power. Because we actually made it ten episodes. <laughs> and so that five-star review, it's a really good idea. Consider it. Let it. Just let that thought incubate in your mind. I completely agree with Jordan on this. Amy, what's your opinion on the five-star review? Should people do I it? I concur. Okay, please nobody, excellent. Please nobody take a soundbite of me saying I completely agree with Jordan and abuse it, because that would be <laughs> awkward. It's a, it's a shame <laughs> that Jordan's the one who gets to record this and has the raw video and audio. <sighs> what have I done? All right. You just well, made a terrible it, mistake. That's okay. It's all good. Nightblood was a mistake, too, and we like him. He's so cute and sharp. <laughs> was good on, that no <laughs> on that note, let's, uh, let's close this thing out. In addition to live episodes of the show that we stream on twitch.tv slash Innkeeper's Table every two weeks, on Monday nights at 7.30 p.m. Pacific Time, 10.30 p.m. Eastern, our listeners can also find our videos on YouTube or the audio versions of the podcast on iTunes, Google Play, and just about any other service that carries podcasts by doing a search for Cosmere Studies. You can also follow us and contact us through Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook under the profile at Cosmere Studies. We would love to hear from you. Uh, give us your feedback about the show. Ask us your questions. Tell us what you think, what your favorite moments from the Cosmere have been. Tell us about what theories you have about what Brandon's got going on. What questions, what topics would you like us to discuss on the show? Anything that you want to get in touch with us on, you can email us at CosmereStudies at gmail.com, as well as contacting us through social media or in the comments section of our videos on YouTube. That's all we got for this week's episode of the Sandersonian Institute of Cosmere Studies. So on behalf of Amy, Jordan, and myself, thanks for watching. And remember, there's always another secret.